So, good morning, everybody. And um, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. It's Professor Beth Shapiro from the University of California at Santa Cruz. So, I've known Beth for the past 20 years. We're both scientists working in the field of evolutionary genomics. And Beth's a colleague and also a very good friend of mine. So, it gives me great pleasure to talk a little bit about her this morning. So, Beth is an extraordinary individual. She is a trailblazer in the field of science. So she is a leader in this very new type of science, which is paleogenomics, that we're going to hear about today. She's a recognized leader. She has won a Rhodes Scholarship. She has won a MacArthur Genius Award. She is a National Geographic Explorer. And now she has the most sought after research grant nearly in the world. She's a Howard Hughes investigator. And these are all grants in recognition of the great science that she's also doing. But not only is she a scientific leader, making the new genomic technologies to be able to sequence whole genomes from fossils, but she's also a wonderful uh, example of a woman in science succeeding in doing it all. So she's a really good role model for young girls. So much so that in Ireland we have this company that's from uh, Donegal, northwest of Ireland, and they make these things called Lottie dolls. And what Lottie dolls are, they are a replacement to Barbie dolls. They are made in the, the shape and the size of, of girls, physical attributes. But also they're made in, in types of role models of scientists. And there's a Lottie doll that represents a paleontologist that's actually Beth. <laughs> this size doll with a, a pickaxe, with glasses, with dark hair in the same shape, and my nieces love it. So Beth, and also Beth is an amazing communicator. So I know today we are going to be in for a wonderful and exciting event. So I'm going to stop talking and allow Beth to talk. Thanks, Emma. I'm not sure I can actually live up to that, but I'd like to begin by denying that I've known you for 20 years. Can't be possible. <laughs> Thank you all for coming this morning. I know it's very early. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about extinction. Um, imagine what it would be like if you were the last living person on Earth. Imagine yourself as Martha, the last passenger pigeon, who came from a species that just less than a century earlier flocked in the billions. Martha lived the last years of her life alone in a cage in the Cincinnati Zoo and died in 1914. Lonesome George, the last Pinta Island giant tortoise. He lived alone, the last of his kind, for more than 40 years of his 100 or so year life. Imagine yourselves as Najin or Fatu, the two last northern white rhinos. Still alive, but a mother-daughter pair. Extinction is a part of evolution. There are more species that are extinct than are alive today. And for most of these, we have no idea how it happened, whether it was fast or slow, driven by overpredation or starvation, or perhaps something catastrophic, like a giant storm or a volcanic eruption. For a few, though, we know exactly how it happened. And today, I'm going to tell you one of those extinction stories, that of the mammoth, the large, cold-adapted elephant that, until rather recently, was found across all of the continents in the Northern Hemisphere. And not only am I going to tell you why the mammoth went extinct, but I'm going to tell you how we figured it out, and also what understanding the mammoth story can do to help us to come up with more innovative ways and more scientific ways of stopping to have to tell stories about the last living individual of any sort of species. So I'm a paleogeneticist. I don't expect you to know what that means because it's not a real thing. <laughs> I'm both a paleontologist, that means I study plants and animals that used to be alive, and a geneticist, that means not only do I take pictures and measure and look at the bones and other remains, but I also take a little piece of that and grind it up and extract their DNA. And using that DNA, I can reconstruct the history of life on Earth. 
I work mostly in the part of the world known as Beringia. During ice ages, the sea level was a lot lower than it is today because much of the ocean's water was taken up as glaciers sitting on top of the continents. This exposed the shallower areas of the ocean, like these in light colors here, and in this part of the world created a land bridge that connected Asia and North America. This land bridge was too dry to become glaciated itself, but sufficiently rainy to produce a community of grasses and flowers and shrubs that supported much of the animals that we've come to associate with the Ice Age. Mammoths, woolly rhinos, different species of cat, uh, all, uh, lots of different species of horses, for example. Today, Beringia looks more like this. The diversity is gone, but crucially, it's still cold. And as any of us with a fridge and a freezer know, cold is very good for the preservation of organic remains. When an organism dies, its cells, its bodies, and the DNA within its cells is in really good condition. Imagine long streamer-like strands of DNA. But over time, things like UV light, freezing and thawing, and critically, consumption by microbes, chop those long strands of DNA down into really short, tiny little confetti-like fragments. And those are no good for genetic reconstruction. In Beringia, though, because it's cold, this process is slower. And we can go out and we can find incredibly well-preserved specimens like this baby mammoth tooth that one of my students who's holding it found a few years ago in Canada. And this, this fantastically well-preserved wolf pup, mummified wolf pup, that we know is more than 50,000 years old that we also found in the Canadian Arctic a few years ago. So we go up out into the Arctic, and we stay in five-star accommodation. <laughs> and for any of you who have not been to the Arctic during the summer, those are mosquitoes, yes? It's lovely. <laughs> and we look for, for these frozen remains everywhere this permafrost, the frozen dirt, is melting. This is actually at an active placer mine in Canada's Yukon, and the gold miners are washing away this frozen dirt to get to the, to the gold-bearing gravels underneath. But as they do this, thousands of bones come washing out of that dirt, and we wander around and collect them. It's surprising even how, how many of these remains we can find, and these are mostly bison and horses and some mammoth. Just to point out this one here, here's a, a mammoth femur that we found in <laughs> northern Alaska one year. So we measure these bones and photograph them, and we take them back to the lab, and we wear a funny suit to protect the samples from our own DNA, and we grind that bit up and we extract the DNA. And we can collect this information from animals that live all across the northern hemisphere and see how they differ from each other genetically. And from that information, we can learn when populations were growing, when they were shrinking, when individuals might have been moving across long distances, and when that connectivity stopped. And connectivity, we will see, is a crucial part of many of these species' extinction stories. So one of the first species to have been studied using this approach is mammoths. Mammoths, for much of the last million years or so, were distributed across the northern hemisphere. Here's the extent of the mammoth, woolly mammoth range in brown. But over the course of time, that range slowly shrunk smaller and smaller as populations disappeared until around 8,000 years ago, when only two populations of mammoths remained, one on Wrangell Island, about 150 kilometers off the coast of Siberia, and this population went extinct around 3,200 years ago, and the other on St. Paul Island here in the Bering Sea. And this population was the second last population to go extinct, but little was known about this. So a few years ago, I became part of an expedition to go out to St. Paul to try to figure out exactly when and why mammoths went extinct. St. Paul is small. Um, this is a plot that shows how big the island actually has been over time. The present day land area here is about 100 square kilometers. It's very small, but it hasn't always been this small. Um, by 13,500 years ago, when the sea level was lower because of the glaciers, St. Paul was actually connected to the Alaskan mainland. And then over time, the sea level rose and St. Paul became smaller and smaller and more and more isolated. Mammoths, it seems, were the only large mammal to have become isolated on St. Paul. There were no bears, there were no lions, there were no people. People didn't arrive until a couple hundred years ago. So there were no predators. It was a mammoth utopia. And yet, they became extinct. Why? So 
to answer this question, we were going to have to collect some mammoth DNA. So we went out to the island and we, we called on all the local people and we said, bring us your mammoth bones. Come on, bring us these things. And they came, to, came out, came together. We, we went scouring around the island and we came up with about a dozen mammoth bones. And this isn't very much. It's not really enough to learn about the evolutionary history. So we would have to do something different. And crucially, there is another really interesting thing on this island, right here, Lake Hill. This is a hill with a lake in it. It's actually the cone of a collapsed volcano. It looks like this today. And the children on the island use it for swimming during the summertime. But lakes are actually really brilliant for ancient DNA because they are a kind of sink for genetic material. During the summer, the wind blows in the plants and the pollen and the leaves. There are things living in the ocean. It is the only source of fresh water on St. Paul. So all the animals that are there will come up to the island and wander in to drink that fresh water. And in doing so, will deposit their own DNA. And every year, that DNA will sink to the very bottom of the lake and then it freezes, and then the same thing happens the next year. So over time, you get accumulation, like a stratigraphy of layer upon layer of everyone that was present on the island from the past to the present day. If we could get this copy, a copy of this, we could figure out who was there, when, and with whom. So during the winter, we went out into the middle of Lake Hill on a boat, on a sled, and we drilled a long core through the lake, through the dirt, all the way to the gravels at the bottom, and we sucked that long column out of the lake, took it back to the lab, and split it in half. And then we went through, and from the very bottom, which we learned later was about 17,000 years ago, we took tiny little plugs of DNA all the way to the top, to the present DNA, present day. And we looked in those tiny plugs of DNA for mammoth DNA, if mammoth DNA was present, mammoths were there. If it wasn't present, mammoths weren't there. We looked at the vegetation community to ask whether the plants were changing over time. We looked at some components of the lake itself. These are tiny little microscopic algae and microscopic animals that can tell us whether the lake was salty or not, how shallow the lake was, for example. And we looked for this other kind of cool thing, which is called sporomyella. It's a type of fungus that only grows on the poops of large mammals. So in case we couldn't find mammoth DNA, if we found this, it would tell us that mammoths were, were probably there. They were the only large mammal on the island. And with all of these data, we actually solved, solved, the, solved the mystery. We found that mammoth DNA was present all the way from the bottom until around 5,600 years ago. And sporomyella, the dung fungus, the same also until about 5,600 years ago. And then gone until about 250 years ago when the dung fungus comes back at the same time as we know that Russian fur traders were bringing caribou to the island. We asked, so this is exactly when they went extinct, 5,600 years ago, but why? We looked at the vegetation. Nothing changed, so they didn't run out of food. But everything else about the lake changed. The water chemistry changed, the rate of sediment accumulation changed, and that community of microorganisms completely turned over from a community that really likes to live in clear, deep, fresh water to a community that prefers to live in very shallow, cloudy, and slightly salty water. Together, these data tell us what happened. Around 5,600 years ago, St. Paul Island experienced a severe weather event, a drought. The lake, the only source of fresh water on the island, started to dry up. Sea salt infiltrated, and with no new rainwater to balance it out, it became salty. Mammoths died on St. Paul because they ran out of fresh water. Had this happened 13,500 years ago, mammoths would have had another option. They could have left. They could have wandered onto the mainland and looked for another source of fresh water, but they couldn't because they were on an island, completely isolated, cut off from the mainland, stuck, and so they became extinct. Mammoths are, of course, not the only wide-ranging taxon to have their survival threatened by the islandization of their habitat. Today, Islandization takes different forms, where the habitats that we've chosen to protect are surrounded not by water, but by other things, like farms and agriculture, by roads and highways and freeways, and by cities of all sizes. This places the plants and animals that live in these islandized habitats in a precarious situation. Any extreme weather event, the introduction of a predator or a disease, 
any of these things can upset the balance of interactions taking place within these island habitats, potentially leading to extinction. We've learned from the past, not just from mammoths, but also from our studies of woolly rhinos and Arctic horses and the different lion species, that connectivity is key. In each of these species, as they declined toward extinction, the populations that remained became increasingly isolated from each other, both geographically and genetically, with each of these island populations functioning as their own tiny, isolated thing, more at risk of extinction. The same is no doubt true today. And as we work to protect these island habitats, which is a crucial part of any plan to protect and preserve endangered species, we also have to remember that plants and animals need to move between them. To escape, yes, but maybe also to find new habitat as climate shifts, or to find a mate. We need to come up with ways to try to minimize the isolating effect of islandization. This could mean building highway overpasses where animals can cross these potentially death-inducing large highways that we now are crisscrossing the habitat with, or at a larger scale, creating linked-up corridors where animals can move, like the Panthera Project has done for cats across the world, or this newer initiative, the Yellowstone to Yukon Initiative, is working to connect Yellowstone National Park to the Yukon, where I do much of my research. Perhaps we need to deliberately move individuals between island habitats, like US Fish and Wildlife did in the 1990s, when they took Texas panthers and put them into the Florida panther population and saved Florida panthers from becoming extinct. We could create green ways, green roofs, city parks, green corridors along rivers and roads, and we could just not build walls or borders, or barriers, or fences of any kind that just further fragment this already fragmented landscape. A sustainable future for biodiversity will require creativity, but it will also require collaboration. The good news is we can do this. Some of the most successful conservation legislation that we have, both in North America and in Europe, includes protection for species whose ranges span borders. Mammoths, woolly rhinos, ice age lions, they're all gone. We can't bring them back. But we still have elephants. We still have some rhinos. We still have horses. We still have Florida panthers. We still have polar bears and long-eared bats. Emma works on bats. We don't have to write the story of the last living individual of any of these species. Thank you. That was brilliant as always. Thank you, Emma. Very entertaining, very inspiring, and also a little bit stressful. <laughs> so you've said that we can't bring them back but you've written a book, <laughs> How to Clone a Mammoth. Right. So maybe you can bring them back. Well, yeah, it I'll turns out, actually, that um, if you buy my book <laughs> and a piece of mammoth hair, which you can do on Amazon, both of these things, um, uh, you still can't bring a mammoth back to life. Yeah. Uh, it, it does kind of function as a, as a how-to book, but really what I try to discuss is uh, all of the different technical and ethical and ecological challenges that would be associated with bringing species back to life. I said earlier that, um, you know, the, the picture of the streamers and the, this, this is what happens. As soon as an animal dies, the DNA in all of its cells begins to break down, and that's immediate. Um, it, often it happens because enzymes in our own bodies start to chew up the DNA to, to make it go away. And when we think about bringing extinct species back to life, the first thing we think of is cloning, cloning like Dolly the sheep type cloning. That requires a living cell. You have to start with a living cell. There are no living mammoth cells, so there will never be a cloned mammoth. There are technologies, though, the new CRISPR gene editing technologies, where if we learn the sequences of the genomes of 
lots of Asian elephants, that's the closest living relative of a mammoth, and also of lots of mammoths, and we have done that, we can line them up on a computer and figure out exactly where they're different from each other. It turns out there's about a million and a half places in four billion bases, nucleotides, the letters that make up your genome, where mammoths and Asian elephants differ from each other. We could then use CRISPR gene editing to swap these out, a million and a half swaps, can't do that yet, right? But imagine that someday you might be able to do that. And then you would have a living cell, a living elephant cell that you have edited to be more mammoth-like. Of course, then you would have to figure out how to turn that into an animal, which is another several stages of technical hurdles that we, we haven't quite figured out how to do yet. Um, a lot of people like to think about surrogacy. Could we use an Asian elephant mom as a, as a surrogate host? And it turns out that I, I used to think that the problem would be size, you know? An Asian elephant is smaller than a mammoth and therefore, yikes. <laughs> turns out, no, they're, they're actually about the same size. So that, the size is not a problem. The problem is that evolutionary distance. They are about as different from each other as we are from a chimpanzee. And I don't think it would be possible for a chimpanzee mom to incubate a human baby or the other way around. Not, there are, yet. There's <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Yeah, there's, there's more to this whole biology thing, I think, than, than we're, we're, we're really understanding, so. Try hard. That doesn't mean that it's not good technology, though. I, I, I like to say this, it's fascinating technology, it's great to think about, but I really do think that there is room to use this exact same technology to try to preserve species that are alive today. Yeah. Now, I'm gonna open up, and we must have some questions from the audience. And a really burning desire to ask something. Oh, hold on one second. We're going to give you a microphone so the people at home can hear. I'm David Kim from Korea. I'm in energy business, but I have other business, one of which is the uh, private equity. And we invest into many uh, things regarding our concern with genetic things. Uh -huh. And my, one of my dreams is I, if I make enough money, I like to set up or create a zoo which is taking care of the endangered species. Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, you know, zoos are, a lot of people have problems with zoos, right? Because they think that zoos are, are doing terrible things, they're making decisions about who gets to mate with whom. I think zoos are critical. I think that um, we have such a problem with loss of habitat and destroyed habitat that is not really habitable by the things that could live there, that for many species, we're going to require zoos, we're going to rely on them to keep these, these different species alive. I mean, the hope of zoos is that you retain this diversity to such an extent that if the habitat were to, were to be cleaned up, were to be available for these species again, they could be reintroduced. And so I think, I think yes, I think zoos are important. And there are ways to do zoos in a very ethical way, I think, um, uh, that will help the animals. As, I mean, we, for a lot of species, we don't understand how to meet their physical and psychological needs in captivity. But it's better to have them in captivity and try to answer those questions than to just watch them go extinct because their habitats are gone. Another question? <laughs> Everybody's just sad. <laughs> I suppose I will have a question for you again. I've lots of questions always oh for you. But so the idea of the zoos, mm. that you have these nearly extinct, wonderful species in these zoos. But one of the big problem with species going extinct is that you get less and less and less and less individuals. So you don't have enough genetic diversity. Think of cheetahs. You could take the skin from one cheetah put it onto, sew it onto another cheetah and they don't reject it, they recognize it as self. But could you use your technology and stuff that you're working on to be able to bring in enough genetic diversity in these endangered species that maybe there are only one or two or three individuals left so that you have, again, the, the genetic diversity that when the habitats are restored, you can release them mm. and they're not already on the way out. So I, I I'm going to answer two parts of that question. The first has to do with genetic diversity. Um, we often think of genetic diversity as this key marker for species' ability to survive. Um, but this is not necessarily true. There are some species, like cheetahs, and this is what made me think of this, where they have lived at such small population sizes for such a long time that they have managed to purge any of those really bad things, uh, mutations that might make them sick or unfit or not able to survive. And so they're perfectly fine despite not having very much diversity. In fact, my favorite analogy when thinking about this, or example when thinking about this, is, is with great apes. 
If one were to go out and survey genetic diversity in all the species of great apes and say, I'm only going to think about diversity, I'm going to pick the great ape with the least diversity, and I am going to put all of my conservation resources on that animal. You go out, sample genomes, sequence genomes, look at the amount of diversity across those genomes, and the answer would be remarkably clear. One great ape stands out among all the rest as having almost no genetic diversity. It's us. Right? I don't think we are in need of conservation money, right? <laughs> might be. <laughs> and the other question is, for some species where you do have a problem, um, there's, a, there's a fantastic program that's run right now. It's a giant collaboration between U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, several research labs, and Revive and Restore, which is a, a not-for-profit focusing on using new technologies for conservation in the San Diego Zoo, to try to come up with new biotech ways of saving the black-footed ferret. This is a, an adorable little ferret that everybody thought was extinct until sometime in the 1980s when a population was found, one surviving population. And that population was immediately put on the endangered species list. They started a captive breeding program. And it turns out black-footed ferrets are great at making more black-footed ferrets. That works really well. But as soon as they're released into their habitat, they get plague and they die. So there's a vaccine. You can vaccinate them before releasing them, but you have to capture them again and revaccinate them, and that's not a sustainable conservation plan. And any individuals that were actually born in the wild would have to be captured and vaccinated twice. Again, not a sustainable conservation plan. But there are two potential other solutions to this problem of the black-footed ferret, and these organizations are trying to think their way through both. The first is, there is at the San Diego Zoo, which is a remarkable thing. I urge everybody to go look it up online. It's very cool. It's a frozen zoo, not a, well, they also have a regular zoo, but this is a frozen <laughs> zoo where they have in their collection several black-footed ferrets that were collected and had cells, living cells, preserved prior to their near extinction. So they're individuals whose cells are in that frozen zoo collection that have totally different genetic diversity than the one population that exists right now. So one approach might be to use cloning, you have cells, to bring those individuals back and breed them into the population of black-footed ferrets that are being captively reared. And this could be a way of introducing new diversity, potentially giving them uh, the capacity to fight this disease on their own. The second approach, which is slightly crazier and slightly cooler, I think, I like this one. is that the, the domestic ferret, which is their evolutionary cousin, is naturally immune to plague. Now, no one knows why yet, but there are studies going on to try to figure out what the genetic underpinnings are of their ability to fight the disease, to not get plague. If what it is that's causing this ability to fight plague can be discovered, we could then imagine using gene editing technologies to transfer this genetic ability not to get plague from the domestic ferret into the black-footed ferret using exactly these same technologies that we talk about for bringing extinct species back to life. Not for doing something crazy, like bringing something back whose habitat is gone, but for keeping this one species, whose habitat is very much still here, who is an endangered species, who's an important part of their landscape, from becoming extinct. This is what I think some of the powers of these technologies are. So you have to, right now we're going to have to try and find ways to preserve living cells Yes. and potentially use technology to introduce the variations that are the survivor variations that we need in these different species. But then I'm so not suggesting that we shouldn't continue to do the things that we're doing right now for conservation, but I do think that we shouldn't ignore these potentially transformative new applications through biotechnology. Uh, we should be growing our toolbox of conservation <laughs> approaches. There's a question, there's ah, a question. We have two, so one here, one here, one here. Oh, loads of them now. <laughs> we've one and a half minutes, let's do this oh, fast. No. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm focused at the moment on the uh, extinct, possible extinction of species in Australia due to our fires in areas like Kangaroo Island where there are very specific species. And I'm wondering as, we've, as we will encounter more and more of these terrible um, weather events which are gonna have this flow and effect, whether there's an international effort for emergency response for, in terms of wildlife to cope with what's happening on the ground as it, unfo as it, as it unfolds, um, because we're facing loss of potential species just in the next few months. Yes, what's happened in Australia is absolutely devastating, and I, I hope that it's not 
something that's telling us about uh, not a hint of things that are that are coming to be more frequent. Um, I have seen, I'm not an expert on what's going on in Australia, but I have seen that there are some tremendous efforts on the ground to try to preserve animals and plants and biodiversity and to capture some of the biodiversity from animals that unfortunately can't be saved and f frozen for posterity in case that we can, we can use this information in future. I don't know the answer to that. I know that the, the frozen zoo in San Diego is part of an international collaboration of zoos that are trying to do similar things like this. And, and not just for animals, there's also seed storage, seed banks and plant storage banks. And, I, and there is a, an international group that's doing this, but I don't know exactly what their efforts have been in Australia right now. Okay, we have time for the last question, but if people have other questions, come up and ask Beth at the end of the session. Sorry, last I, one, please. Uh, What's the possibility of quantum computing helping you do a lot of this acceleration or work around that? I know some work has happened on University of California trying to adopt some quantum uh, algos, but in your field, do you see uh, this helping you achieve Quantum goals? computing. That's an interesting question. I, I, you know, I'm, I think where, where our bottlenecks are, are in um, sequencing and aligning multiple genomes. Uh, we have a, the very strongest bottleneck is even if we can generate these four billion letter genomes for all the different species, trying to figure out how they line up next to each other is a, is a hard compute problem. It takes a lot of time. I, and I'm, I'm sure there's some application for, for more advanced computing to, to help us get to the bottom of that. The reason that's useful is if we can line up everything that we know is alive and we can find places in the genome that actually are conserved across all of life, we can learn that those are important fundamental bits of the genome that can't be mutated, can't be changed if we want those species to survive. So on that note, I want to say we need to sequence the genome of all of living life. Yes. <laughs> um, we need to try and find ways to avoid this happening again and to thank Professor Bet Shapiro for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.